Welcome back to National 5 Biology. We're staying with Unit 1, Cell Biology, today, and we're going to be moving on to Kyria 2, which is transport across cell membranes. So, from Kyria 1, you should hopefully remember that all the cells we looked at had a cell membrane. You should hopefully remember the cell wall that we looked at in some of the cells, and that it was made up of cellulose, and it was fully permeable. I said we would cover the cell membrane later on in another key area. So today we are going to look at the cell membrane. Now the cell membrane is termed selectively permeable and that's a really important word because it means that some molecules can pass through the cell membrane in or out of the cell and some molecules can't. It has some form of control over what can pass through it. What you also need to know is the structure of the cell membrane. So this diagram at the bottle here shows the two molecules that make up the cell membrane. There are phospholipids, which are the sort of tadpole-like structures here, and there are proteins, which are the, the big blobs that you find dotted along it. You need to know both of these and be able to uh, illustrate it potentially in a diagram. What you also need to know is, like I was saying, some molecules pass into the cell or out of the cell, and some can't. So you need to know some examples of what can move through the cell membrane. So some things that are required by the cell that need to move into the cell from the outside are glucose, oxygen and amino acids. Some molecules need to move from inside the cell to outside the cell and they are carbon dioxide and urea, just waste products. I try and remember this a bit like what we need. We need glucose and oxygen and we release carbon dioxide and urea, so it's very similar in that aspect. All of those molecules can pass through the membrane. One task that we tend to do in the classroom, that I'll talk through here, is to put a solution of glucose starch inside visking tubing, which is a selectively permeable plastic that illustrates the cell membrane. If you put that into a beaker full of water, you can look and see if the molecules from the glucose and starch eventually diffuse through the membrane, like a cell membrane, into the water. So essentially, if you put this bag of glucose and starch into the water, at the start, if you tested the water for the presence of starch, you would find there was no starch, and you would also find that there was no glucose. This is because it's still inside the cell membrane. However, as time moves on, you'd find that something's a bit different. You'd find that there would still be no starch in the water, but that there is a trace of glucose in the water. The glucose has moved through the semi permeable or the selectively permeable membrane into the water. The starch, however, has not moved in. This is because starch is too big to move through the selectively permeable membrane. This is just an example of how some molecules can move through it, but some cannot. So, again, selectively permeable membranes, some molecules can move through the membrane. To look at this process that I mentioned there of diffusion, we look at something called the concentration gradient. Now, if you look at this diagram here and you imagine this triangle, you imagine a sort of hill, at the top of the hill is a high concentration of a substance, say for example glucose. At the bottom of the hill there is a low concentration of the substance. If you wanted to move from a high concentration down the hill to a low concentration, Imagine rolling down the hill. It doesn't require any energy. You can just move down there. However, if you wanted to move from a low concentration to a high concentration, then that requires energy as it would have to move up the slope. So this is illustrated through this movement that we'll look at in, uh, in certain types of movement across the membrane. High concentration to a low concentration does not require any energy. So again, imagine this ball rolling down a hill. However, the low concentration to the high concentration does require energy. That is an active process that we'll look at in a minute. So the first method of transport across the membrane that we're going to look at is diffusion. Now diffusion is, is one of the easiest to show. It's the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So as we were saying, because this is going from high to low, it does not require any energy. It just happens. You don't need to add any energy to it. If you imagine something like spraying a perfume, in the area that you sprayed the perfume, you'll smell it quite quickly. People who are away from you, say 10 feet away, will not smell anything. But as time goes on, 
those uh, perfume scents move through their molecules, diffuse across them into the rest of the room and people can start smelling them. You've not added any energy to that, you've just added the high concentration in one area of perfume and that diffuses across into areas where there's a low concentration and you start to smell it. Another way of showing this is if you have Skittles. Let me look at the food colouring of a Skittle. If you arrange them around the side of a Petri dish, or you can use a plate as well, and fill it up to about halfway up to the Skittle of water, what happens at the start is that the Skittle has a high concentration of food colouring, and the water has a very low concentration of food colouring. What then happens is diffusion takes place, the food colouring moves from the high concentration of food colouring on the skittle to the low concentration and the food colouring spreads out across the water and you start to see this nice pattern that happens. Again, you have not added any energy to this process. It is a passive process, it is just diffused across. The second form of transport across the membrane that I want us to look at is almost exactly the same as diffusion, however it is the movement of water molecules. As soon as anything mentions water molecules, it is osmosis. So, osmosis is the movement of water molecules from the area of high concentration to an area of low water concentration, and it's across a selectively permeable membrane. So again, it's through the membrane, it is the movement of water molecules, and to make sure you get the marks in the exam, make sure you're making it very clear that it's high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. Again, this is passive, it's going down the concentration gradient and it does not require any energy at all. The final mode of transport that we're going to look at is the opposite of diffusion and osmosis, it is active transport. Active transport is the movement of molecules or ions against the concentration gradient. So what happens here is that molecules move from a low concentration of a substance to a high concentration. And I've looked at before, that needs to go up the concentration gradient, so that requires energy. This is termed an active form of transport. If you think of active in terms of using energy, it's quite a good way to remember it. It requires energy to go up that gradient. And what it also uses is the proteins found within the cell membrane. It is the proteins there that are responsible for moving something across or up a concentration gradient. So if you just remember this diagram we've looked at before, these large blobs of protein are what are necessary along with energy for active transport to take place. In the exam, there are several ways you could be asked to show your knowledge of osmosis. In this uh, section here, what I've done is I've added six uh, beakers, three up the top, three down the bottom. And the first three, you have to look at the direction in which water would move. So osmosis from a high water concentration to a low water concentration. So if you pause the video and for the three up the top, try and identify if water would move from left to right or right to left through osmosis. Okay, so to go through the answer to these, if we look at the first one, 100% water is a higher concentration than 90% water. So if you imagine these dotted lines are a selectively permeable membrane, water moves from the left to the right. It moves from high concentration to a low concentration, 100% to 90%. In the next one, you'll find that 75% is the high concentration, so it would move from right to left, 75 to 10. And then the final one, we would move from left to right. 20% water is a higher water concentration, than the 15% 15, 15 of water, so it moves from left to right. However, down the bottom, it's a bit harder because it's gave you the percentages of salt solution. If we're looking at diffusion of salt molecules, this would be a different situation, but the question is asking you to identify the direction in which water would move. So we need to change the 10% and the 5% solutions so we look at what the, the percentage of water must be in the solutions. So, if there's 10% salt in the solution, then there must be 90% water. If there's 5% salt in the solution, it must be 95% water. So what we're looking at here, water would move from the 5% salt solution to the 10% salt solution. 95% water to 95% water to 90% water, high to low. In the middle one, 
it'd be the same process. 85% water or 50% salt to 80% water or 20% salt. And finally, the last one, you find that 2.5% of salt solution has a higher water solution, a higher percentage water solution than the 5%, 95% water solution. So it move from right to left. Always be very careful at looking at what the question is asking you. Always for osmosis or diffusion, you're looking at high concentration to low concentration, but if they give you anything other than water and say you have to identify osmosis, you need to find out what the water solution is. Finally, what we're going to look at is going back to Kiria 1 cell biology for a brief moment. You have to know either by sight or by description what would happen to certain cells under different osmotic uh, conditions. So if you place an animal cell into a solution with a high water concentration, what would happen is water would move from the high water concentration outside the cell into the lower water concentration inside the cell through osmosis. Water would en enter the cell and the cell would swell up and it would burst eventually. Similarly, if you put this into a low water concentration, so imagine putting an animal cell into a very high salt solution, the water inside the cell would have a higher water concentration than the salty water outside. So again, osmosis moves from high to low, the cell would end up shrinking because the water exits the cell. One thing to remember here is in the first example, when the cell bursts in a high water concentration, is that, remember, the animal cell does not have a cell wall. So it has a bit less structure, a bit less protection to what can happen to it. That is why the cell swells up and bursts. The other cells you would have to look at, and this would probably be a bit more evident when you do the potato osmosis experiment in class. If you put a plant cell into a high water concentration, the same thing happens. Water moves from high water concentration outside the cell into the lower water concentration inside the cell. But because the plant cell has a cell wall, it doesn't burst. It swells up massively, the vacuole swells, the cell membrane presses up against the cell wall, and you can see that it is physically swollen. But the cell becomes something that we call turgid. So do not say swollen, you say turgid. Okay, it's swollen up, but it's not burst. Similarly, in the low water concentration, again, water would exit the cell through osmosis. The vacuole empties its liquid, the cell membrane starts to pull away, it's all very, very shrunken in. But again, we don't call it shrunken, we call it plasmalized. And those are two really important words to remember to get the marks if you're ever asked about osmosis in plant cells. So again, that is the end of Kiria 2. Kiria 2 is quite a tricky Kiria to get your head around. So again, you should be using this video to be taking notes, to consolidate the notes you already have from class, and to be using it for a revision. Don't just listen to it all in one go and think you've got it. Go for each one, pause it, go back, answer the questions, try and preempt what I'm going to say. I'm going to attach the quizzes and Kahoot questions for this key area that you can complete in your own time on the YouTube channel. But this is a list of what you need to know throughout the key area. So as we've already looked at, you need to know what the cell membrane is made up of. You need to know the terms slightly permeable. You need to know the difference between diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. And it's important you also know the difference between what happens to animal cells and plant cells when they are exposed to high or low water concentrations. Thanks so much for listening. I'm going to get on with the Kia 3 now and upload that when we're finished.